<laughs> okay, so we're doing uh, carrots, beets, onions, and potatoes. And um, we're going to start with carrots. Now, first of all, I have to discuss the soil because um, for any um, gardening that you're going to do, you're going to have to have uh, a rich soil that's been well supplemented with organic material. And so that means that you're going to have to compost. And there's just no point in trying to plant in the soil that you may have just in your backyard that you're just digging over and you're just adding a little bit of this and that to it. It's not going to work. It's going to have to be a well-dug garden and it's going to have to have a lot of organic matter because <clears throat> what you have to do is create a living soil. And to create a living soil, you're going to have to have a lot of humus to add to it. And to create that humus, uh, you're going to get it from the compost heap. So that's what has to be your first uh, plan of attack uh, for gardening, is to get a good compost heap going, and probably a few of them. Um, then, once you've, uh, we can't get into how to compost, because we've done workshops on that, but you can do some reading up on that. Um, but the, the idea is that you have to get that humus created, which is that nice black friable, um, uh, it looks like soil. And uh, you, in that, you can have the aged manure and your leaves and your grass clippings and whatnot, all that that's you know, turned over in your pile. And what you want is an, an, an aerobic pile where there's some oxygen entering. So that it, what you're ending up with is something that smells earthy, sweet. It's, uh, it'll crumble in your hand into aggregates, nice uh, little lumps, you know. And when you squeeze it, if it's wet, it's not, it's not running with water. And, but it's also not too dry, like not sandy. It's going to be very rich and well, worm castings, if you've seen those. Uh, they're very rich in nutrients because the earthworm itself, to digest the food, uh, uses bacteria, not uh, acids like we do. So whatever uh, castings you get in the soil uh, is going to be food for your plants. So you can't grow any of these root crops or any of your vegetables in the garden unless you're, you're uh, digging in a lot of organic matter. And that's just the bottom line. Um, if you're, you know, if you're not doing that, then you're going to be forced into buying uh, chemical fertilizers to add. And the other thing too is any of the amendments that we mentioned in here, like the blood meal or the uh, the um, uh, kelp meal, bone meal, any of those, they will not work in a soil that isn't uh, properly worked over with organic matter. Okay, it's just not going to work. And because the um, microorganisms, the billions of them that are in there, in the compost pile, for instance, the heat that's created is created by bacteria. And so once the bacteria have done their job, then the fungi usually take over. And uh, so it's, it's a series of events happening within the compost pile. And it happens in the soil as well, as long as you have that organic matter there. And you always have something that has to break down in the soil anyway. But to add that humus is what you're going to have to do. So <clears throat> for crops, like for instance, I'll start with the beets you're going to have to add quite a bit of organic material to the, uh, your beet bed. And it is a cool season crop, so um, it does much better um, you know, in the spring and the fall. In the summer, you're going to know, and you'll notice in the heat that the leaves tend to uh, wilt. The, the, your crop's just going to go basically flat. Transpiration, it's just too hot out. Even though your soil is moist, those leaves are going to go flat on you, so don't worry about that. Uh, squash uh, leaves do the same thing. Um, Okay, oh, was I supposed to start with carrots? All right, okay. All right, <laughs> too late now. Anyway, okay, so what you have to do then is um, make sure that you don't have, go excessively with the nitrogen, okay? Uh, in your compost pile, you'll have a, a lot of nitrogen in there, a lot of carbon material, but you wanna be careful how much nit nitrogenous material you put in there because you're gonna get a lot of leafy um, atop and very little beet, okay? Um, you can have more nitrogenous material for the uh, Swiss chard because you want lots of leaf. Okay, they're uh, directly related plants. Okay, they're, uh, I guess, cousins if you want to call them. Um, the one you get the beet and the other one you get the leaf. So for the beet um, bed, um, you would want to plant in a block style. So a block style, is, uh, it could be four feet wide, um, allowing for a lip uh, around the edges. And, um, okay. Uh, some of this, oh, it's not very clear, but anyway, we have an edge around, uh, on the sides of the beds. So when you water, uh, the water stays in there, and you have to deep water your plants so that it goes down the, and the roots go down rather than just a sprinkling of water on top so that you have, you know, your, the bulk of your roots staying near the surface. That's not good. You want depth uh, with your watering, and you want depth with the soil. So you're going to, your spade depth, about 12 inches or so, you need at least that for the beets. In fact, um, this one is a winter keeper beet, and you can see... <clears throat> this is from West Coast Seed. They're the only ones that sell a winter keeper uh, beet seed. The tops, this is, uh, my husband forgot to turn off the heater in the pump house. 
uh, when it was really cold, so things warmed up a little bit, and then things started growing. Um, the, our actual root cellar um, uh, deteriorated, so we can't use that anymore. But um, you get these roots, and then you get the little feeler roots that come down from the bottom, and the fungi actually attach themselves to the roots, and they extend it even further into the soil. So if you don't have, you can see just, you probably have to go at least like that if you can, to allow for these feeler roots to, to say to the beet, keep growing, because they do stop. Same with carrots. All these vegetables will quit on you. Uh, well, except potatoes, they go upwards. But um, so make sure you have the depth to your soil. So that's winter keeper. And this one is a Detroit red. They don't usually keep as well in the root cellar, but look at that. You see how long that is? And it's a smaller beet. So make sure you have the depth of soil. Okay, now in the block style, <clears throat> the idea is that you're going to get a lot more produce uh, from your, um, your bed. So if it's four feet wide, you, you can't go wider because your arm can only stretch so far, so you go two feet from one side, two feet from the other. You can make it three feet wide if you want. Now, in the block style, you can still keep your rows. You can have like three rows in there of beets, um, or you can scatter your seed around. Um, and then um, your rows, you do have to have like a, a hand spacing between in the, in the, in the um, block style. Um, and then that way you're not having the compression, like the compaction from walking along your beds either. It's always going to stay loose in the center and your beets are going to grow. Uh, there's um, the, the soil, because it's well prepared, it's going to be loose, friable, you're going to get air in there, you're going to get water percolating through, and you can mulch the sides of the beds um, if you want, or you can grow uh, a, a lot of um, herbs on the sides of your beds. You can put a lissom seed down. Lissom is a short plant. It tracks all kinds of pollinators. Um, just remember where you put your, your seeds so you don't dig it up again. And um, that this, anything that you can put in your garden in the way of a canopy, foliage canopy, will hold water. Because we're expecting, uh, I think, a really dry summer. And last summer was, was really harsh on a lot of the uh, plants in the garden, particularly the, the potatoes that didn't get any water. The other thing too now, okay, I'll, add, I'll tell you what we, we add to the soil. Um, We'll put in sprinkle wood ashes for extra potassium. Wood ash, only sprinkle if you're going to use it. Some people think they can take their bucket of ash from the wood stove and then just kind of heave it into the compost pile or onto the ground. Um, just remember that wood ash and water create lye. And if you have any of that near your little seedlings, um, well, you're going to kill them. Uh, so you just do the sprinkling. The bone meal, bone meal should be at the root level. So what you're going to do then is... Uh, I'll, I'll, okay, the wood ashes and the bone meal, you're going to dig them under. If you think that you need the extra nutrients in the way of micronutrients, you can add some kelp meal. Kelp meal, uh, well, we have samples at the back there. Um, you would also sprinkle that on your, um, your bed and then dig it under with your spade. And um, you don't have to till if you've got a small garden. We tend to have uh, too, much, too much to garden, so we have to use the tiller half the time. Uh, but tilling is not a good idea because... Um, the more, you, the more you till, the more organic material you're going to lose to the atmosphere and to um, um, wash out of uh, nitrogen. It's just not a good idea. You get more erosion uh, with the wind. Okay, so you dig those in. Now, boron is essential to beets. Now, I, you know, I, I meant to look to see if there was a crater on here. Do we have? I don't know if you can see the black crater on that beet. But, oh, there's one right here, a small one. But when you miss putting boron, um, watering it into the bed... Um, you'll find that that's where you get the black craters on the beets. We are living in, this whole terrace area is deficient in boron. So it is a micronutrient, and you must follow um, directions for um, watering that into your soil. It's just a quarter teaspoon to 12 gallons of water. All the notes, actually, we have notes here. You're going to get this if we don't have enough copies for people. You can get it online, so you don't have to worry too much. Okay, so a quarter teaspoon to 12 gallons of water, that's very, a very small amount to stir in. It's like you're stirring something, you don't see it, you know. But it's, it's essential to a lot of the root crops. It's even essential to fruit trees, to apple trees, uh, even potatoes. So there are many, uh, the only two that you wouldn't add it to are the beans and cucumbers. For some reason, they don't want the boron. Okay, those two. But um, follow directions for the boron because uh, even online, some of the um, figures that they give you for the boron uh, it's, it's, it's excessive, and it is a micronutrient, and you can sterilize the soil because you've got all these metabolic processes occurring, <coughs> excuse me, chemical reactions occurring underground, and if you go and add too much of, of one nutrient like that, a micronutrient, <coughs> you can really upset the balance of things. Oh, excuse me for a second. Things like <coughs> nitrogen, they wash, nitrogen washes out of the soil. You're constantly adding nitrogen, but something like uh, boron, you don't want to do that. And then you will not get craters. 
those black craters. And it's, it's not a disease, so um, you just peel the beet a little thicker. And if, if you've got a really bad case of it, though, it does enter into the beet and you've got to carve more away. Okay, so those are the three things we usually add. Um, I, and kelp meal if you want. Okay, now the, the beet seeds themselves are clusters of seed. It's not just one seed, so you'll have like three or four in a little cluster. And that's, that's usually how you buy it. <clears throat> Although some seed companies will, will sell the, the individual little seeds, but they've already broken them for you. Anyway, so when you've, when you've planted your beet seed, you're going to have to thin. So you can thin with scissors if you want once they're, you know, so high, uh, four, four inches high or so, you can take scissors. Or if you're going to do like I end up doing because I don't want the scissors in there because I, I, that's too tedious for me. So I just support the one that, the beets that I want to keep and I pull from the side and then I quickly um, press in the soil and I make sure it's all watered afterwards. And I don't do that in the hot sun. You do that kind of thing on a overcast day, drizzly day, okay? And if you're going to disturb roots, um, make sure that you don't do it in hot sun. And then they do fine. <clears throat> you can also start uh, beet seedlings if you like. I've never done it, but uh, people have done it. Uh, the nursery actually sells the beet seedlings, but you would have to uh, transplant those again when it's a drizzly day or overcast and no sun the next day because they would take a beet. And you'd have to protect them with burlap or something, you know, a covering, a uh, temporary covering. Um, <clears throat> because root vegetables, they do not like being moved. Uh, transplanted. Okay, so now, once you've put your seed down, you can cover that with something if you want. If you want to get a head start on the weeds that are going to come into your bed, and this applies to the carrots as well, you can actually put a sheet of plastic over top and weigh it down, and then a few days, uh, you know, five days later, or depending on the weather, if it's really warm, it could be five days later. <coughs> Excuse me. Otherwise, um, um, it could be a couple of weeks, and then you check once in a while, lift up the plastic. It could be cardboard on top, too, or boards. It doesn't matter. It depends on, on how big your bed is. And when you start seeing them come, then take that off, and then your beets have a head start, and they're not fighting weeds. And this works particularly well with the carrots, because carrots, as you know, they're, it's very tedious trying to thin them out and to keep them clean. Now, bolting. <clears throat> if, the, uh, if you're uh, planting your seed a little too early and the plants come up, <clears throat> and the temperature drops, and if it's below 7 degrees Celsius, and then with the long days, you can end up with bolting. And in the garden, we usually always end up with some bolting. <clears throat> Last summer, we had, we had some bolting. It wasn't serious, though. And uh, so it doesn't pay in this area, particularly jack pine, to be planting too early. Uh, we did it with onions one year, and it was like 400 and some onions, and practically all of them ended up bolting because it was, it was a nice warm spring, and then we got that cold snap, and it just they went into uh, second year mode because they're a biennial plant. And so then they think that they have to produce their seed you know, to reproduce, so this is what they do. And so a lot of plants will do that if you um, are too quick to plant in the spring. Usually you're fairly safe here in Terrace itself, but um, so I wouldn't necessarily trust all that. Okay, so um, I'll just quickly look over here. Um, <clears throat> that would... Uh, be probably the main thing for, oh yeah, sometimes your beets, you have chunks eaten out of them. I don't know if you've noticed that. I've noticed I've had like good chunks taken out of my beets and voles or mice will do that. If you have a resident snake, they can, snake can take care of that for you. Um, <clears throat> my, we have a snake, a big snake in the garden. I think he's been feeding on them. But uh, you can get common scab on um, beets as well. The same thing as with the common scab is on potatoes mainly, but you can get it on beets. Uh, but that just peels off. It's a fungi that does that. Oh, yes, and leaf miner. The, the leaves on top can end up with the trailing marks that it turn, they turn gray, and it looks like uh, an insect has gone through. Well, that uh, fly lays the egg, and the egg hatches, and the maggot <coughs> ends up between the leaf layers. So when you're spraying something, if you want to try and kill it, even if you were using BTK, for instance, it's not going to affect them because uh, at the, the chemical... <clears throat> even if it's natural chemical, it doesn't get through. But you know, the damage is never that serious anyway. Um, not like some plants, like I'm thinking the aspen trees, they're just so, the leaves are all gray because of the leaf miner damage. But um, beets, not that bad. And the one, uh, one thing that I get at home, and Anna's noticed that too, is the Cercospora leaf spot, uh, fungal disease, and you get round lesions on your leaves, and you've probably noticed them, and you probably just, it's never that serious, so you don't worry about it too much, but you just don't eat those leaves, and you just kind of pick those out, and, because I eat the leaves, I, you know, I freeze them every winter with the Swiss chard leaves, and uh, excellent greens. But um, what you have to do if you've got a serious problem with any, any fungus in the garden, you're gonna have to mulch, 
and keep the grain and your watering from splashing up the spores onto your plants. And the other thing too is cleanliness. Don't be working in your garden when, uh, certain, like, especially the like beans, for instance, even the beets uh, that are known to have the fung uh, fungus, um, you spread the spores on your hands. Okay, so beet, uh, beans in particular, make sure that the plants are dry and then harvest. But never harvest when they're wet because you can wipe out your beans really quickly with, uh, with fungus. And beets, not so bad. But it's just something to be um, aware of. Okay, so these uh, sheets have the companion plants. I won't go into that too much because we um, haven't got a lot of time. And, of course, beets are extremely healthy for you, so um, eat them cooked or, uh, or, or uh, fresh, grated in salad. Um, perfect uh, vegetable for you to fight all kinds of disease. Now, the carrots, um, <clears throat> again, uh, carrots, you're going to have to watch how much um, uh, manure you... Um, well, each manure you work into your uh, bed, you'd want to do it block style as well, just as with the beets. Uh, because what you end up with are hairy carrots, <coughs> if you've got too much manure worked in. This one was uh, hairier looking until I tried brushing it, but, um, a lot, but you can get it so hairy that it's just all lined with hairs. And uh, that's when uh, there's too much manure. Also, if you're not watering your carrots enough, you can end up with hairy carrots because those little, uh, it's the way the uh, carrots mean means of absorbing more waters by uh, sending out more little hair, hairy roots to, uh, to get as much water as possible. Um, <clears throat> but you just, uh, you know, peel them, and that's okay. Um, so the uh, block-style planting, again, you're going to get far more out of it than if you just, uh, say, did a single row or a double row in a, in a narrow bed. That's not how you're going to get high production with carrots. And because it's going to be so dry this summer, probably, uh, the best thing is to stick with that block style and then have a nice canopy of greenery that's going to keep that soil moist. And again, you're going to have to do the deep watering. Now, the carrot bed does like ash on top, some wood ash sprinkled. You don't have to do that. You can use bone meal if you want, just for the extra potassium. Again, that has to be dug under. Um, get it under at least four inches. You want it where the roots are going to be um, growing. And... Um, Boron. Boron is also necessary for carrots. I don't know just the damage quite as much, but I have seen red, a redness in the leaves before. You can get that from uh, boron deficiency, but the carrots can be affected. They can end up being um, uh, harder, like the, the texture of them is not nice. Uh, they won't grow normally. But like I say, um, there's probably enough boron in our garden now. Just boron does stay in the soil. As long as the plants don't use it all up, that boron will stay in there locked in. So uh, anyway, that hasn't been a big problem with carrots. Uh, not like with the beets. Okay. Um, now, splitting of carrots. If you're overwatering your carrots, you can get them splitting. Um, in the fall, make sure that you're not, once they're, once they're grown, the soil is usually moist enough in the fall, make sure that you don't keep watering and splitting your carrots. You can even do that during the summer with too much water if you've got big carrots. And if you um, have a problem with splitting, then buy the carrots, the seed the, with the narrow, the, the ones that grow narrow, and not with a big high shoulder, uh, top shoulder. Um, Nantes, uh, Chantenay, uh, Danvers, those are all ones that, they're all open pollinated that we grow, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then for watering, I should mention too that you stick your finger in a couple inches, and if it feels dry for that couple inches, you have to water, okay, deep watering. Um, that'll be a good indicator as to whether you should water or not. And the beets themselves, they like a sandy, peaty soil. But you, and like I so say, you still have to add that organic uh, material. Just don't go crazy with it with, with this particular crop. And you know what? If you, if you do too much, put too much in one year, you'll know not to put so much the next year. And every year, you're going to have to add organic matter anyway because you're going to have to go an inch or two of your good compost on top of every bed and work it in because you have to feed that living soil. Those microorganisms are going to keep using up what you give. And so um, every year, you're going to have to add another layer of your compost. And um, you'll see that the earthworms, once you start doing that, and if you're digging in your soil a bit too much, you're going to see the earthworm activity in there, and you're going to know that you've got really good soil when you start seeing that, when you start seeing a lot of ground beetles and ants are busy and even slugs. I mean, slugs break down organic matter too, you know. Um, uh, when you see a lot of this uh, kind of activity, um, even just below the surface of the soil with the, all these beetles and whatnot, um, you know that you've got a healthy soil because they wouldn't be there if it wasn't healthy. Um, that's just uh, the way it is. 
Uh, if you see toads in your garden, like we have a resident toad in every garden area, and I've got lots of garden areas. There's, there's a toad that stays there, um, and I know where their home, the home is because then I don't disturb it, you know? And I know the snake gets around, and probably eats some of the toads too, but uh, hopefully he's eating more mice and voles. Okay, now, <clears throat> the carrot bed, it's really important that you have a clean carrot bed before you put your seed in. Uh, because I'm sure probably a lot of you have grown carrots and they're really tedious to thin and to pick clean. Um, this, oh, yeah, okay, I don't know if you can see these pictures very well. That's the school garden over there. Um, so what we were doing at the school garden, I'll just talk about that one for instance. Um, in the bed, we would uh, have it covered in the fall. It would be prepped with the manure in there and dug under uh, in the compost. And then it was covered with plastic so that in the spring, um, the plastic would be taken off and it's all nice. And you don't even have to dig it then because you've done that digging in the fall and you're not disturbing the soil structure in the raised bed because it's, it's nice, friable soil at that point, especially when you've been doing this every year. And uh, to sow the seeds with the kids, we mix it with sand and it was colored sand and then scatter it because it's really difficult to figure out how much carrot seed to use because you can really go overboard. On the, the this uh, the handout, um, there's a some ideas of how much you could put down, weighing or, or uh, uh, the numbers of seed according to the package. Anyway, you can see, oh, try what I've written down, see if that works for you. Um, <clears throat> so then we scatter the uh, seed, and then when you see where the seed did not get scattered because of the colored sand, we'd get it brushed over, you see, so then it was an even bed. So when that's done like that, then with a scattering of soil on top and patted down, and we used sifters for these kids, you know, and just sift it on top so that it wasn't a really thick layer of soil going on top. And then patting it down and then a cover of plastic on top. We ended up using a lot of plastic. In my, in my own garden over the years, I've used boards and cardboard. But, and then weighed it down. And the quickest carrots came up in warm weather was five days under the plastic. Uh, the longest was more like two weeks in cold weather. So uh, if you uh, are too slow in taking the plastic off or peeking there and you see all these little white heads, it doesn't matter. You take it off, it, photosynthesis kicks in right away and it turns the, your um, crop turns green. But the thing is you've got the head start on the weeds and it's just perfect for uh, keeping the weeds down. Now if you go a little crazy with your seed and it's way too thick and you know that it's, you, you, know, you almost feel like crying because you have to thin all this out and it's just such a, such a tedious job, um, take a rake one of the metal rakes that um, is rectangular in shape, the heavy metal ones with the tines that are about uh, half an inch apart. And you go in there, and if you have to close your eyes to do it, because it's really hard to kill stuff, but you put the rake in there and pull it across um, the bed, and it'll knock down the ones you need knocked down. And then after that, because you can't get in there and pat, because it's not practical, uh, you know, it's a rake, right? Then make sure you water, and the watering, uh, good watering, and it will pack down that soil again and your roots will, the ones that are, are left standing will survive and you'll be much better off. There's no point in leaving a crowded carrot bed. You're going to get carrots that are all twisted together. I, I think we've had some pictures like that. Anyway, the kids think it's great, you know, when they're all intertwined, but that's not good for, uh, uh, you know, for when you're in the kitchen, you want a carrot that's straight and you want to do this really quickly. So that's one way of getting around that. Um, okay, now, what else is I going to say about the carrots? Um, oh yes, for harvesting, um, some of the carrots can get very big. These aren't so big. Uh, a lot of the big ones are already eaten. This is what's, you know, sort of started growing in the, in the you can see, in the root cellar. Um, you can take the green top and you push down. Push down and it will break a lot of the roots and then the carrot will come out much easier, okay, without um, disturbing the soil too much. Now, because the carrot rust fly is prevalent in this area and it's, it is a real, it can be a really serious problem, um, when you're pulling carrots out of the ground, make sure that you seal that hole and that any carrot tops that are exposed as you're doing that, cover them up, bank soil around them, because they're going to turn green anyway and then you're cutting it off. But the thing is, the carrot rust fly zeroes in on the smell of the carrot green top that's crushed. Okay, so, um, and, and they, they just nestle in the, the perimeter of the garden in, in, in shrubbery and, you know, like weeds and whatnot. So if you keep your garden clean, um, you won't have such a nice spot for them to, uh, to stay for the night. And then when they do smell the carrots, they go in on them really quickly. So you get your first batch um, beginning of, uh, what is it now, the middle of, middle of June, beginning to middle of June. 
you'll start finding the, uh, um, the fly. Well, you don't see it, it's so small anyway, but you'll start noticing damage if your carrots are already growing. And then middle of July, you get another batch, and apparently you can get a third batch. I'm not sure that I get those, but um, anyway, the, they're, uh, they're pretty busy, these flies, and they lay an awful lot of eggs. And uh, you're going to have to protect your, your carrot bed. The best thing, we're, do, we're putting a cover, fa uh, cover crop fabric over the bed. Yes, just like that, uh, because uh, the damage is too extensive from the ca uh, carrot rust fly. And the maggots, like we had a few carrots we were pulling out of the root cellar that were totally rotten because bacteria gets in and next thing your, your um, carrots are rotted. But for storing the carrots, you have to store them. These, uh, some of the stuff was store, stored in damp peat moss. Um, resp, uh, a lot of it was stored in um, uh, sawdust that was partially decomposed. Yeah, there you go. Okay, and see they don't touch. They mustn't touch. Um, just in case one rots and then it rots the rest. So you're spacing them. And it doesn't take very long to do this as long as you have your stuff ready to go. And I always like it damp. Um, you can read all sorts of things on how to store um, your vegetables, you know, dry, uh, a dry uh, filler or damp. I use damp. And then that way these carrots stay nice. The, the moisture isn't drawn out of the carrot into the, the bedding that you're putting them in. So that's what I do. And then the, the size tote, this actually came, I think, from Save On. Um, the recycling totes, but they're really good for um, storage in the um, root cellar because they have the holes around the side. And you don't want a solid plastic container. A box is great, a wooden box. Um, but you need some air, access to air uh, for these uh, vegetables so that... Uh, sorry, what do I have to do? I have 10 minutes left? <laughs> oh. All right, sorry. <laughs> okay, 10 minutes. Okay, it's all right. Wire worms are a problem in the garden as well. And they can tunnel right into your carrots, make nice little holes, and then what happens is you end up with bacteria in there, and then that will rot your carrots too. Um, they don't seem to bother with beets, but they do bother with potatoes. Now, the onions, oh, i got to go a little quicker here. Okay, now with the onions, make sure that um, what you, what you, when you're preparing your soil, you don't make it too salty, so any of this bag manure that you're that you're buying, if that's what you're using, uh, that is salty, okay? And uh, also may have graze on in it, a herbicide that is causing a lot of trouble in gardens these days. Um, and you don't know if it's in there or not. You don't even know if the hay that you're getting from uh, parts of uh, northern BC is safe. Okay, so don't trust any source. The best way of testing to see if you've got graze on it, because it'll kill your potatoes, uh, the nightshade family, tomatoes, potatoes, uh, pepper plants, um, and beans. So the best way to test for that is to have um, you can have three pots for a control. So you buy your potting soil, fill those three with the potting soil, and then have three more. And then what the, the material that you're worried about, say it's your, uh, your compost heap, because now you've probably put some hay in there that might have graze on in it, okay, or manure. And then do half potting soil and half the mix of your, your compost, and mix it up and put it in there. And then put uh, two or three bean seeds in each one, and then you can see, for the, mark your control and mark your, 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 once you're testing and then see how they turn out because bean seeds are very sensitive to this herbicide and they'll curl up. And people have actually destroyed their greenhouses like their tomato plants, pepper plants, uh, because they inadvertently introduced it. Okay, and it is, uh, it's around. So don't trust any of the uh, bag manures for that. You're gonna have to do a test if you're gonna uh, start purchasing that sort of thing. Um, okay, so the onions, okay, in the write-ups here, there, you'll have the um, onions that grow well in this area. We need long-day onions, not the short-day ones. Um, so you have to uh, make sure that you're purchasing the right seed for the long-day uh, daylight hours. And um, the onion maggot is a big problem around here, and it was uh, quite a problem last summer. Um, you can use nematodes, the beneficial nematodes, if you would like. Oh, yes, there, you see. I don't know if you can see that or not, but the little maggots are in there. And uh, the beneficial nematodes uh, are very helpful, but you're going to have to follow instructions on how to uh, get the nematodes into the soil, because otherwise you're going to waste your precious money, because they, they're not that cheap to buy. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to use a cover crop. Or you just plant lots of onions, and you allow maybe a quarter of them to go to the maggots, and you get the other three quarters, something like that. But that, you, that's kind of the way you have to deal with this sort of thing, um, because you do not want to put poisons on the ground. Oh yes, and radishes. 
Yeah, you can put, you can interplant your, the best thing with onions, put them around your garden in different places to avoid this problem. And um, yeah, things like radishes planted in amongst the onions, lots of herbs, to the, because the, um, the aromatic herbs, the fly won't like the smell of those and it won't even find them. Uh, some of the biggest onions in the garden were in amongst calendula. They were just huge and they were hidden there and they just kept growing, the tops were coming up and in the fall, a big surprise is huge onions. Okay, so uh, plant in amongst the herbs um, to help yourself. Okay, and in the fall, um, when about a quarter of the onion tops are starting to brown and fall over, that's when you take, say, a long rake handle and you go and you, and you take the handle and you just go across them all and just knock them all down because you know that the weather's going to change and they have to start drying uh, in your soil. Oh, okay, yeah, and you're going to get a lot of onions maybe that ha are too thick on the, uh, this is from the school, that one, I guess, um, too thick and green, and uh, they are not going to dry. So what you're going to have to do then is what we do is um, you make broth and can it. This has all different vegetables in it. Uh, carrots that, you know, couldn't go in the root cellar, uh, oversized beans, anything like that can go in there and just can it. And then these are the Japanese onions started from seed. You only get green, green tops. You don't get a bulb from this. And so if, and the, uh, onion, ma the uh, onion maggots, do not destroy these ones. They don't seem to like them. I've never had a problem with that. So if you want to really make broth, that's what you're going to have to do then. Uh, or you want lots of onion for sauces that you want to store, you know, maybe freeze or can, um, try that, Japanese bunching onions. Okay, so, and then the potatoes, well, we end up usually spending about an hour talking about potatoes. So, <coughs> okay, <coughs> let me see. Um, I'll, we'll talk about the problems. Okay, we're gonna end up with five minutes? Okay, I have five minutes. <laughs> um, it's going to be a hot, dry summer probably, so the best thing in that case is to plan for, for a potato crop that will do well in that, in the, under those conditions. So determinate potatoes are only going to grow um, to uh, a certain height, a certain amount. They'll create one layer of potato in the ground, okay, rather than layering. Uh, indeterminate potatoes, the long, uh, growing season potatoes, long season potatoes, they keep going up and keep sending out side shoots, whereas the determinate potatoes do not do that. So you get the underground stems only at one level. So that's what you would want for hot, dry weather then, so that you're not doing all this hilling, because the hilling, you can't water hilled potatoes very well. It's really difficult. We ended up with that. We couldn't, we couldn't water that. And what happens is you end up with uh, a lot of problems. One problem here. Well, I'm going to see if I can cut this, I cut it before, is this internal rust. Um, you get these uh, markings that look like rust, and that is from hot, dry weather. Um, the, the potato can't absorb the calcium fast enough. And it's just like in, in tomatoes, blossom end rot, if you know about that, you get that black hardened area in the tomatoes when they don't get enough calcium up. The same thing with the potato, okay? And that's what this is from. So you, you want to make sure that uh, you water your potatoes well this summer if we're going to have hot, dry weather. And because you can't eat this one, you see, and there were too many like that. Some of them are really bad. Um, see the, I don't know if you can see the brown marks in there, but um, that's, it's not a disease. It's just from a lack, of, it's a met, mm, from metabolism that's been interrupted because of the lack of calcium. All right. Now, the other problem that we had last summer were with the wireworms because the wireworms don't like the dry weather either, and the potato is nice and moist inside, and so they were tunneling uh, a lot more than usual uh, in the potatoes. And so once you've got the hole in the potato, when you put it into storage, you're gonna get bacterial infection, and then your potato starts to rot. So, um, and then scab, this was a whole new potato um, bed area because I was trying to get away, want to try and get away from um, the flea beetle. That's another problem that's uh, quite common around here, the flea beetles. And uh, about 10 years ago, they came onto our property. I don't know how I got them there, but it just, you know, they're not going away. So I have to deal with it. If you have a serious problem with flea beetle, you're gonna have to do four year rotation. And um, the flea beetle likes other plants as well. So you gotta uh, read up on that to make sure that you are not constantly giving a nice home to these flea beetles. And the flea beetle is just a tiny little beetle the size of a pinhead. And when you go to grab it, to pinch it, and squish it, or whatever, uh, it, it hops away. That's why it's called uh, a flea beetle. And it looks black, but it's actually uh, 
two minutes, metallic green in color. So anyway, what, uh, we use diatomaceous earth and we sprinkle that on top of the plants, uh, the young plants, um, just because it, it can be a really serious problem. You're going to end up with buckshot holes all over your foliage and it looks terrible, but the worst damage is that the maggot goes down, um, the lay, eggs are laid at the surface level there, you know, with the soil and the plant, the stem level, and the maggot uh, goes down into your potato and it digs up only about a quarter inch deep into your potatoes, but I tell you, it makes a real mess of your potatoes. And you'll know when you've got the, the uh, marks all over your potatoes, the trails, and when you uh, store them for the winter, you're storing them with the maggots in there and they just keep feeding all winter. So you want to do something about that. And one thing that has foiled them in our garden is a thick layer of loose hay because the, on top for mulch, uh, the flea beetle finds it very difficult to get through that maze of uh, hay down to lay its eggs at the base. So if you have a problem with that, get lots of loose hay on top because you, I don't know of any way of seriously getting rid of these things once they're on the property. Um, so watch out for that so you can attack them as quickly as you can with some diatomaceous earth or whatever. I didn't cover everything. <laughs> oh well. These are parsnips. <laughs>